Let's do this. It's time for Hanging with Langan. I like that she's got a big, dirty mouth that gets her in trouble. Wow. Stop me because I'm having a good time. Hi, you guys. Hello. Hey, I got a new bell. It's in the Hanging with Langan theme colors. Do you love it? Ding, 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 ding. The Sicilian is not loving it because every time he bugs me, I go, okay, go cook. Okay, leave me alone. He's like, Maureen, I'm going to take that bell. Um, and of course, I have the original bell. So don't worry. We're, we're keeping it together in just a moment. So excited. I have a wonderful guest, Sandra Joseph, who has the distinction of not only being on Hanging with Langan, but being the longest running leading lady in the longest running show in the history of Broadway. She played Christine in The Phantom of the Opera. She's standing by in the green room. I'm so excited, you guys. And I'm so honored that she's joining me. I love her because she's real, she's down to earth, and she's freaking talented. Those are my kind of people, authentic. I, I dig that. Okay, but here you hear you. Um, quick couple updates. I don't know if you heard about this, the uh, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, where people who aren't Christian but pretend to be Christian, like they don't know what the Holy Eucharist is, they call it a cracker, and then they become president. That's where people like go. So they actually have a line in the sand. Some rapper named Young Pharaoh, he got kicked out because he says that the Jews don't exist. Like it's, it's made up. Jews are made up. I don't know how they can run everything if they're made up. But what I want to know from Mr. Young Pharaoh is that if Jews don't exist and Judaism doesn't exist, who has all the lasers? I want to know who has the friggin' lasers. Where are the lasers? Okay. You know, his name is Pharaoh. They did kick Jews out of Egypt and they did enslave them when they weren't kicking them out. So maybe, you know, to him, Jews don't exist. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, other thing, uh, hey guys, this is just, listen, I don't wish anybody death. And honestly, it's not funny when people die. Stop with your gender reveal parties. This is what you do get people in the waiting room at the hospital uh, or around a midwife with balloons. And when your wife gives birth, once it comes through the birth canal, bing, uh, gender, ding, 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 uh, gender reveal. Okay. You don't have to blow up things, pyrotechnics. Guys are dying in sheds from shrapnel. It's okay. You want to be a man to your child? Live. That, that's, that's just me trying to help you. Okay. I do the best I can. I'm only one woman. So um, letting you know next week, Alan's Y. Bell, a comedy writer, original Saturday Night Live writer, will be here hanging with Langan, best friends with Gilda Radner. She was the godmother to his children. I have chatted with Alan a number of times, and he is fantastic. We're going to talk about his book, Laugh Lines, how he helps funny people be even funnier, and his new project with Billy Crystal. So I'm very excited. But right now, um, let us get this party started. I want to give a proper introduction to my guest coming to the Hanging with Langan stage, Sandra Joseph, history-making Broadway star, a best-selling author, TEDx speaker, and a keynote speaker. So wonderful. You have to you have to see her speak, her TED Talk, or her keynote. It is just about being fearless. She'll tell us more about it. I've watched them, and they're terrific. 10 years, more than 1,500 performances. She starred as Christine in The Phantom of the Opera. So she now holds the distinction of uh, the longest leading lady in Broadway's longest running show. Author of the number one best-selling book, Unmasking What Matters, 10 Life Lessons from 10 Years on Broadway. Great book about her childhood, getting where she's gotten to. It's And it's real. You know, it's like everything was just so perfect for me. She's real. Uh, you got to read it. She's been on everything. CNN, The Today Show, The View. And she was on Oprah. So um, I'm going to welcome her. And then we're going to go back to the good old days. Okay, Sandra Joseph. <laughs> Hi, Mo. How are you? Bud? I'm so happy to be here with you. Thanks for having me. You're very gracious because I know what it takes to uh, come on board these days with all this technology, right? All the technology, uh, putting on real clothing, makeup, thats it's all new these days, isn't it? Well, it's the only thing that keeps my uh, lipstick from going stale. So it's like, <laughs> wow, I get to put on lipstick on Tuesday and a pink and the pink <laughs> feel bright. Oh, yeah. and happy. We're uh, twinning. I love we're it. Totally twinning. Um, tell me how you're doing during this crazy pandemic times. You know, it's been, um, in some ways, a wonderful break from travel. I realized how exhausted I was from being on the road all the time. My husband, Ron Bomer, as you know, was on tour with the Book of Mormon for seven years, and right up until when the pandemic hit. So I was either traveling to be with him or traveling to do my own gigs and rarely home in San Diego. Um, so 
being home for this stretch of time and slowing down has been for me like a, a forced retreat in a way that I really kind of needed. Now it's been so long that it, it, I'm I'm not itching to get back on airplanes and in hotel rooms, but I think we all want to be able to get back to some semblance of a normal life and just see see our family and friends again. How about well, you? See some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Because some of them has been like, I'm so sorry, I can't see you. Or, you know how much I'd love to see you. Um, you know, as a performer too, you know, it's it's weird. It's it, the, it, the forced downtime. It's like good, but the self-imposed thing that I do internally to create or I have to work that I don't seem to be able to get rid of. So the self-imposed pressure all the time. Do you do that at all? Oh, it's been interesting, hasn't it? Watching what the mind does. I've been really watching how it will find something to stress over. For me, it's it's even become about organizing my home and it's, it's what stretching the groceries so nothing goes to waste, um, planning, yeah. you know, just the, the three o'clock in the morning thoughts that will just go on whatever it is. It, it may not be work things, but the mind has a way of finding something to, to chew on. And that's the work. We well, I want to do. If you guys are just tuning in, this is Sandra Joseph, who played Christine in The Phantom of the Opera in New York City on Broadway for 10 years, 1,500 performances. What I'm going to do, too, uh, I want to show a clip. I'm going to put this on your, um, I'm going to do another banner here so those tuning in, I don't have to keep reminding them. Look at this. I can do tech right in the moment. Um, <laughs> I, it's really amazing, my gifts. You are fancy. <laughs> that is very fancy. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> You're in Phantom of the Opera. I'm going to put you in Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> well, I have photos and all that, but I want to be able to say this too. And if you have questions, comments, she'll take them. You know, we'll, we'll hear you out. Just don't be nasty and freaky. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> I, I was, you know, you can't play clips from, you know, professional Broadway shows or music. There's laws and licensing regulations. So, of course, we couldn't do that. So, just for you, what did Maureen do? She dug deep. And I know, I know you're gonna love this. Oh, um, I know uh, so I, it's good. It won't be. It's good. You guys I'll gather now. Of that. <laughs> We're um, okay. This is back in the day oh, when no. it's so sweet. It's so sweet. I took. I just took a clip uh, from when uh, Sandra Joseph was a guest on Oprah, on my beloved Oprah, our beloved Oprah. All right, here we go. Check this out. It's about a minute long. When I was about eight or nine years old, my parents took us to see Annie on the ride home. And I started to cry telling my parents, I know what I want to do with <laughs> my life. I know what I'm supposed to do. Despite deeply knowing her dream of performing on stage, Sandra didn't know how to overcome her lack of self-confidence. I was always very shy. I wanted to sing and to act. I was very timid and yet I wanted to do it so badly. I think for so many of us as young girls, if you have a dream, there's still that little voice inside that says, well, who do you think you are? What makes you think you're so special that you could do something that big? I had never even set foot in New York. I had never seen a show on Broadway, yet I dreamed of that. You know, I was dreaming big dreams. Whenever I needed courage that I couldn't muster on my own, I would always find my inner Oprah. Strong, confident, courageous, successful. Sandra soon found her courage. For the last 10 years, she starred as Christine in The Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. I didn't dare to dream that I would get the chance to do it on Broadway. I remember Oprah saying, God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can for yourself. God can dream a bigger dream. <laughs> Uh, I am living proof of that. Yes, you are. Bravo. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> that is so sweet, Sandra. <laughs> they, I, I don't even know where they found all those old pictures, honestly. Uh, I, I don't know where those pictures are. Those childhood photos. I guess I sent them a bunch of stuff, or my well, mom did. Tell hi, her you mom. want them back. Tell them, oh, hi, mom. Tell her you want them back. You know, <laughs> what years were you, Christine, in The Phantom? Basically 96 to 06. 
I was on tour for 96, 97, and then I moved to Broadway in 98 um, and left there in 2006. What I want to talk to you about, well, first of all, Oprah and I have the same birthday, January 29th, just so oh, you know. Oh, I love yeah, so, it. Yeah, so it was about time you came hanging with Langan. <laughs> what I love about Oprah, and, and you said it then, and I think it still resonates, she had an energy and has an energy that I think is so sorely missing right now in our world. Hmm. That's seeing the best in everybody and wanting the best and walking in the best shoes possible. I was watching, there's a longer clip of that, you guys, and I'm going to put it on my Patreon account so you can see the whole Oprah clip um, when you go to Patreon. But I was crying. I'm like, I, we, I always say we need more Oprah. Yes. And the beauty of what, what Oprah gave to me and what she gives to everyone is when I said, you know, I would find my inner Oprah, she followed that by saying, you found your inner Sandra. Mm -hmm. She embodies her own authentic power and presence and confidence, but not in a way that's about ego. It's, it's about service and just doing, doing her right? And that's what she, the gift I think she gives to everyone simply by being who she is. She gives other people permission to rise, mm -hmm. to, to straighten mm -hmm. their spine and, and find their own inner courage and confidence. And we all need examples of that. You know, what I think what you just said, I say it just differently, but it's just the same thing is when somebody show, is able to be who they are, their humanity, uh, with that, with their foibles, with what their strengths, their weaknesses, then you feel more able to be yourself in that too. You're like, I, you know, somebody just shared a personal family story with me, somebody I'm friendly with, but you know, not close friends with. She goes, gosh, did I tell you too much? I go, no, like, no, just tell it. That's your story. Like I, then I feel more comfortable around her for telling me that. Yes. Well, and Brene, God bless Brene. She's given us so much information and, and language for how to have authentic conversations, how to be vulnerable and share our story, how to own our story. It takes incredible courage, but people have to earn the right to hear your story. And, yeah. you know, we, it's, it's not about oversharing or just dumping everything on no, everybody, no, no, no. but to <laughs> share in safe spaces our, our truth and, and our vulnerability is one of the most powerful things we can do. Well, you, I read your book, uh, Unmasking What Matters, and I really enjoyed reading that. And people, you can get that. Let me show them the cover. I really loved reading your book. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a picture of it because I do all my own text, Sandra, so I always know it's there. <laughs> I know everything's there and I do my own graphic editing. It's don't worry. I have 15 hours a day to, to do <laughs> yeah. like a six year old, three minutes Unmasking what matters, 10 life lessons from 10 years on Broadway. What I, I want to talk about your childhood that led to Broadway. What I recall from reading your book and I read it a few years ago, what resonated for me was just an ordinary childhood with a connection to your father with his encouragement that just that again makes me cry so that's what i remember you know how you remember feelings so i remember the feeling of the relationship with your family but particularly your dad's and his encouragement and leading to rejection in new york because you weren't your authentic self can we talk about some of those things yeah so i as as i said in that oprah clip i really wanted to sing and act i saw annie when i was a kid the national tour came through my hometown of detroit and I knew that's it. I want to be like that girl up there. But it seemed utterly impossible for someone like me. I did not like being in the spotlight. I hated being the center of attention. I was not the typical performer kind of kid. Like, hey, look at me. I was hiding in the corner with a book. So immediately there was, there was this inner struggle going on of knowing that I wanted to do this thing, but feeling that it was utterly impossible for me. And on the ride home from seeing Annie that night when I was maybe eight years old, um, I remember my dad noticing that something was up with me and he had loved acting. My dad loved actors and singers. He did some theater around Detroit um, at, when he was younger, you know, before I was born. And it, the, the people that were his heroes were like Brando and Paul Newman and he loved Sinatra and would make me listen to old records of Nat King Cole and the crooners. And he had a real respect for people in the arts. And so he said, he looked at me in the rearview mirror on the way home from seeing Annie and he said, what's going on? Are you okay? And, and I got emotional 
because I, my heart had just cracked wide open. And I said, I want to do that, but I'm, I'll never be able to. And I just remember the look in his eyes. And they were full of such love and belief in me. And I, I could tell that he was so happy that I wanted to do that. And I recognize that is not the reaction that a lot of people get, from the, especially once it becomes about wanting to pursue it as a career. Yes. Yeah. But he supported that decision, too. It was really his encouragement that helped me find the courage within myself to to go to New York and give it a shot. You know, he, he said, you're going to have to really love it. You're going to have to be really disciplined. But if you don't at least try, you, you'll always wonder what might have been. So give it five years. Give it your best shot. If it doesn't work out, you can come back home and figure out plan B. So how did he help you or your parents? Because you have a sister too, yeah? Yes, who also loved theater and loved singing and acting. She took a different path, but it was her encouragement also. Um, she was two years older, and uh, she was doing shows in high school and said, if you just show up after school, you can be in the chorus. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> really? She was playing leads, and I was in the chorus, yeah. Oh my God. We had like a family that was like, uh, get my siblings, get away from me. I don't want to be seen with you. There were six of us. You're, you're ruining my street cred. <laughs> six. Well, I can imagine you'd have to compete for the, the attention in a family of six. My goodness. Just save the money for therapy. But, um, so, but your father said something like be disciplined, you know, like it sounds like you have very rooted, grounded, advice. I mean, you weren't this wealthy family. You were a working class family, right? And yeah. classes or how did you train to get to the point to go to Broadway, to go to New York first before? I didn't have as much training as, as I needed when I got to New York, honestly. Um, and it, back then, the training programs weren't at all what they are now. Now kids like, come out of the womb singing and acting and dancing and having training. <laughs> I started in high school with a local mom who had been an opera singer taking voice lessons when I was 16 once a week for half an hour. Thank you mom for driving me to Mrs. Rice's house in her basement and I started learning how to sing from her. It was wonderful training and I'll tell you Maureen that something she said to me at my very first voice lesson I keep with me all the time to this day. She, it was so simple but she, when I left that very first voice lesson at 16 years old she said, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. And it has it, been the wisest piece of homework I've ever gotten, and I still practice it. She said, start paying attention to how you breathe. Simple instruction, but oh my goodness, that is profound. I don't know if you've read the book that came out this last year, New York Times bestseller called Breath. I haven't read it. James Nestor, I believe. Sorry right. if I got that wrong, but I, I think that's the up. author's yeah. name. Wonderful book. But the breath is so, uh, it's such a powerful tool that's with us all the time. And, and it's so underutilized. So just by paying attention to it, whenever I'm, I start to get stressed, start paying attention to how you breathe. Drop your breath down into your body more. Is that what it is? Like, what is, that's what you do. Like, you'll feel it in your shoulders and just go, or you'll feel it because I do that. That's when I'll go, oh, okay, what's stressing? I'll be like, okay, what's stressing you? Chill out, Lang. Yeah, exactly. Get in, as, in singing, we talk about getting your breath under you. So your breath is sort of, if it's up here, it's and it's shallow, and, and then it, you think about when you're like the extreme version would be a panic attack where you're, <laughs> you can't get your breath. The right, right, breath. right. And so to okay. drop it down, like, to your low abdomen. That's what my teachers really taught me. And I still go and see my, my beloved college voice teacher, Meredith Zara. She's well into her 80s now and still sings like a bird. It's stunning. Her high notes pop out like she's a teenager. I don't even understand it. But understand she was it. always, she was all about breathing low in the, in the belly. And when you drop your breath down, you, it does kind of center you and make you feel calmer and more in control. So you you went to New York with this training. Where did you go to college with Mrs. Michigan Black? State University? That's where I met Meredith Zara, and I took my first acting class. And uh, I I mean I really didn't 
study it until college, like seriously until uh -huh. college, but I didn't even major in it because I was scared to, to admit to the world or myself that I wanted to actually try to make a living doing it. It seemed absurd. So I didn't major in it. <laughs> I got a communications degree, something to fall back on, you know, mm -hmm. and then I went to New York and started temping and yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't get a waitressing job. I think I wasn't tall or pretty enough. And I what didn't are you have talking any. about? Oh I'm my talking goodness. about, have you seen some of the, those women in those restaurants? <laughs> oh my God. The hostesses. I was just trying to get a hostess job, but the hostess hostesses were like six feet tall and perfect. And uh, I was a scrappy Midwestern five foot three. <laughs> Just, well, before you even said that, somebody said she's so beautiful. So, oh, you know. that's kind. Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, I guess maybe you didn't have that superficial model look, you know, that like I haven't, you know, that I'm very tall. And if I could eat a meal, I would stand up straight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. And I had no experience waiting tables. And, you know, New York restaurants, the competition is fierce. There are so many out of work actors that it's hard to get those waitressing jobs. So I was answering phones and doing receptionist jobs that didn't require computer skills. It was kind of early on in computer days. So those skills weren't too necessary. But yeah, I was pounding the pavement, getting rejected all over the place. And, you know, I got some, a cruise ship job. I got a European tour where Ooh. I was singing little, yeah, it sounds glamorous. It was not. We were on a bus every day. They were one-nighters. We were traveling, you know. <laughs> I'm going to tell this is okay. Oh, you guys have a new bell. I have to tell Sandra's story. So um, <laughs> just remind me because people are like, oh my God, you were on a cruise? You were touring Europe? I did a gig, a comedy gig in Dublin, and my cousin lives in Dublin. I hey, come meet you, Mo. I come meet you. I go, okay. And it's like this place called Temple Bar. And he goes, Ah, oh, where where you go now? Where do they put you? Where's the back room? I go, no, I sit on the stairs that lead up to uh, the attic. You, that's where you wait until they call you into the into the room. And he goes, No, no, Mo. I go, you yeah, know, this is the life. Yeah, I'm gonna sit on the wooden stairs by the attic until you're called to the stage. People don't know what you go through. I mean, oh you're Christine at Broadway. She could not get a job waitressing in New York City, people. Andrew <laughs> Joseph, Christine and the Phantom of the Opera, the woman who had 10 years, 1,500 shows, 15,000, 100, how many shows? 1,500, oh, good. Goodness. Like, it's a lot. Go ahead. No, so but the, uh, and Maureen, I was rejected from a different version of Phantom at a dinner theater in Ohio right before I got cast in the big Broadway well-known Phantom. No way. Yeah, right before. It was literally <laughs> like the, the audition right before I got Christine. I was like, I, I'm hanging it up. I can't even get a dinner theater job in Ohio. And the next thing I knew, I was in the the big phantom. So you just don't know. And, and you, it's part of what you learn. You know this, you know, we just can't take it personally and you can't make That's it, hard, you too. can't equate your worth with your work and, and <sighs> feel worthless when you don't get it. Because sometimes you're just not what they were looking for. Doesn't mean you're not going to get the next thing that comes around. So I want to ask you about uh, when you auditioned for Phantom originally in New York. I, it's a really moving story. In her book, um, Unmasking What Matters, Sandra Joseph, available, Amazon, folk, fantastic read. Uh, yes, uh, so yeah, you're going to get it. I understand, Charlotte. And Matt Polk went to high school. He says, you're amazing. And I, your cousin, George Joseph. Hey, cousin. Hi, cousin George and Candace in Vegas. <laughs> Very cool. Um, all right, take us there. You're New York, you're, you're temping, you're schlepping, you're picking up backstage magazine like we all do, looking at the rundowns. and Every the, Wednesday right night, yep. <laughs> so your first audition, you, how do you get your first audition? What is it like? Take us there. I actually got myself an agent, so he, he rarely called, but he did get me in the door for Phantom. So I had an appointment and I walked in there, guns ablazing, ready to nail it. And I was so terrified, <laughs> so overwhelmed just by the fact that I was standing on a Broadway stage and Hal Prince, the late, great Hal Prince is sitting five rows back. And I, I, I couldn't believe I was in his presence. I'm, and there's the chandelier. And 
you know, I had practiced every single syllable of the song, Think of Me, which they gave me to learn, and I was determined to nail it, but I was a little bit uh, fight or flight, and I uh, fight, flight, freeze, so I f yeah. kind of froze. I sang, the words were coming out, the notes were coming out, but nobody was home. I mean, like, deer in the headlights, frozen, not a star turn uh, audition so i did not leave did you know when you left were you like oh or did you go oh, i hope or i i didn't feel despondent i thought well wasn't my best but maybe there's still a chance i mean i just had no idea i had no idea and my agent called me the next day and said you did not get the leading role, but they want to give you a job in the ensemble on the national tour. So it wasn't the starring role on Broadway I was hoping for, but right. it was still a gig. You know, I was going to yeah. be on the show. I'm suddenly working. I'm a working actor. So I was thrilled and I got to understudy Christine. So I was in the chorus understudying Christine on the tour for a whole year. That's how I, my journey with Phantom started. So when you, when somebody's in, okay, so then let's, then that moved in just naturally to the Broadway. Well, <laughs> not no. exactly. Okay. Um, after that, after I'd been in the ensemble for a whole year, um, it turned out the actress playing Christine on the tour got cast in another show. She was leaving and they gave me another chance to audition. So they flew me from the tour back to New York, which was very yeah. exciting. And I got to audition for the second time. And this time, you know, I had been understudying the role. I had been in the show. I was less intimidated by the environment. And I had learned Christine, you know. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I've got this this time. I'm going to show Hal Prince that I have learned Christine. And I went out there and did like the Christine scarf choreography. She's got this scarf and think of me and it's dramatic. And I was giving all the drama and I forgot to give the most important thing, which was the realness, the, the heart, the authenticity. I was disconnected in a different way. The first time I was deer in the headlights, the second time I was over the top phony and I didn't get it. Oh, no. <laughs> And no. then I was despondent. That time I was devastated because oh. I really felt like that's it. I blew it and they'll never give me another shot. Oh. So it turned out. And this is one of the lessons in your book too, on, on, um, yeah. on masking what matters. And I want to put the co cover of the book up for those just coming in right now. And it'll be all up on my website too, but unmasking what matters, 10 life lessons from 10 years on Broadway. So that lesson... Uh, go from there. So you, you leave, you had your scarves, everything looked perfect, but it wasn't coming from the soul and the heart. Right, right. So the the lesson from that, you know, after many tears and beating myself up and hating myself and all those things that we do, <laughs> you know, I recognize in my attempt to be perfect and to prove to them that I can be what I think they want me to be, you know, I can do the Christine thing. I left out my authenticity and that's the thing that draws people in I left I was trying so hard not to be vulnerable to be in control mm. when the vulnerability is I mean that's a defining characteristic of Christine so I had to to get it through my head that you know if I ever am given another chance I have to go in there with a different mindset and say I'm not here to prove myself. I'm here to be myself, to bring Ooh. my authentic self. Ooh, be myself, like, be not, yeah. Well, like be that. the character, but through my, through Sandra's heart, to, to allow the vulnerability to be there and the fear. Christine is nervous when she starts singing that song in the audition. And I had to stop trying so hard to get the part and, mm -hmm. and start just living in that moment. It, so it was a big lesson about presence. I'm not here to be perfect. I'm here to be present and to bring my whole heart to this moment. And that is what made the difference. Mercifully, they gave me a third shot. <laughs> they gave me 
one last audition. How long like, did you have to wait for that last one? Did, I wish or- I could remember. I yeah. don't remember, but it was, wasn't terribly long. I th- it was less than a month, I believe, because the role that, that I had auditioned for, they kept going and, and sifting through people and they <laughs> couldn't find a, a Christine. And they, you know, the supervisors were, were wonderful to me. They had seen me in my understudy rehearsals and I think they put in a good word with Hal Prince and said, she gets in her own way <laughs> in auditions. She yeah. kind of gets in her head and, and let's give her one, one more chance. Wow. Wow. Well, those are the people around you. You know, that's on a very different level, performing at a comedy club, the wait staff will say, she, she's good. Or that's where they get the word. Like the, maybe the booker walked in and saw one bit that tanked, but they'll be like, no, no, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I love that, Maureen. I love hearing your stories. And I, I'm sure you have s- learned so many things along the way that you could share. And I just have to say, what a huge fan I am of yours. I've oh. been fortunate to see you perform wow. and to, to be in conferences with you, both in person and online, where you're hosting, you're emceeing, you're oh, doing your comedy you. thing, all the many different hats that you wear. And you're just so brilliant and you're so generous to everybody else involved it's never about ego it's always about shining the spotlight on all of the other people around you and lifting everybody up like you were saying that's what oprah does is she lifts us up and gives us permission and i think what you do is the bravest thing on earth and i bow to you for having the courage to put yourself out there, especially when you were starting out. I'd love to hear all of your stories. Someday. Well, we'll do that over some wine post. Okay. But, <laughs> um, that's for sure. Well, thank you for saying that. It's hard to let that in. So I say thank you from uh, Sandra Joseph, Christine, the longest running leading lady and the longest running show Broadway. And you did something so gracious. You made a lovely testimonial as we're all pivoting in these work times and focusing on our online work. So it meant the world to me. You have no idea how much it meant to me. But it would well, mean you nothing. have you have endorsements from people like Jack Canfield and Jerry Stiller, and you've got a lot of big names endorsing your work. Well, so I was, I was happy you. to be a small name. Um, <laughs> you know what is it? so self-effacing? But you stop. You're so great, and I have to say, I mean, I'm self-effacing too. But it's you're at a whole different tier. But it doesn't matter. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't even believe there's such a thing. I just don't. I just don't buy that. I I don't feel there's any tears there, well, there are me. tears but no tears <laughs> a lot of tears <laughs> but, I, but i think that's your authenticity we're, we're peers i we are absolutely peers and friends and you know we we've been through the trenches and through the same stuff where you know I, my european tour that sounds so glamorous when you were talking about your ireland thing i one time our our dressing room was where they milk the cows in the in a, the stables in a barn <laughs> They'd converted this barn space into our performance space. And literally, we were in the dressing room to get changing into our costumes with the machinery where they, they milk the cows. <laughs> you can't make this shit up, you guys. It's all so humbling. But I think because you're so authentic and because you're not a diva, there are some people who don't have that depth of authenticity or groundedness. So that's why, if anything, we're peers. It's because it connects on that level for me. And that's why I adore you. And uh, I, okay, I haven't, uh, you've heard this story, Sandra, but the masses in pod class land have not heard this story of how we connected. It's so insane. And I get very quiet before I go on stage. I was hired to do a birthday party in San Diego for this wonderful woman named Ariel Ford. And I was acquainted with her from having I just was acquainted through performing elsewhere and I get invited. It's a lovely intimate space and there's like 10 table at each, 10 people at each table. I don't know anyone. And as a comic, I usually hang back and I don't want to talk to anybody until after the show, you know, I, I'm in my head and I'm watching everyone to see what jokes I'm going to make. I don't know. Oh, I'm so scared. And you and your husband, Ron Bomer, who played the phantom, we're going to talk about that in a moment are seated next to me and I, I don't know you guys, you know, I mean, of course I know what your work is, but I don't know you yet. I don't know that you've been in that. 
So I'm, they're like, don't be nervous. We're performers. We have your back. And you really meant it. Don't, you'll be fine. We, we're sending you performer energy. We, we know what this is like. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad. Creative people next to me. I go up, I perform. You know, it was a fine job. Good people. Lovely people. And I get to, it's so nice to sit down. I go, okay, now you rise. I go, oh, so what do you do? I'll never forget this. Oh, well, we're actors. Oh, yeah. Like, what kind of acting? Well, we're, uh, it was in Phantom of the Opera. I go, oh, like maybe in a barn in San Diego, <laughs> outside of San Diego. No, I didn't think that. But you know, I don't know, local theater, we're in San Diego. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm Broadway. I go, wait a minute, you play Christine in Phantom on Broadway. <laughs> and I, I just did a birthday party. I was just there <laughs> doing a birthday party, Sandra. I, and Ron, oh, I was, I was the Phantom. Yeah, well, I did a birthday party. And that became our joke, you know? <laughs> oh. It was a very elegant birthday party. <laughs> oh my God, it was elegant. And I was so and nervous. And you were brilliant. Oh. I can't believe you were nervous. That's, so, I mean, I should believe it. Of anybody, I should believe it because I still get nervous, of course. Right? And I'm the same before I perform. Before my keynotes, I never want to be out there talking to the people. I just get in my head. And I, and my husband and I are very different in this regard. He he likes to engage. He's much more extroverted before a show. He likes to go out, talk to people, whatever. I am in that hotel room hiding until it's go time. And then I'm fine and, and we'll chat. But... But we had so much fun meeting you that night, and you were brilliant. <laughs> oh, well, it's about you, but I just want to tell that story because it's so funny, but it's really a testament to how you know connected you are to people's creativity and what they're going through, or just a person sitting next to you. When you um, were on that stage on Broadway, how did you know, like, when you would look out, would you see, could you see the first rows? Could you see them at all? Because sometimes I don't know what you can see from the stage. Um, I love that. That's a fun question. Um, not, I mean, yes, but more the silhouettes. We could okay. see the, the silhouette of, of people. Hard to make out. I mean, we never looked at them, of course. <laughs> I see um, you. You're not. <laughs> that'd be so awkward. That's so awkward. Um, but no, not, not specifically. Well, would you get nervous if you knew somebody was coming to see the show? Oh, yes. Uh, it depends who the somebody was. Uh, supervisors, Hal Prince. Yes. Other actors. Very nervous. Um, my family, I would get excited. I would feel calmer when my my people were there, my family, because I could fall flat on my face and they would think I was fabulous, you know. Oh, that's nice. What's that like? Um, <laughs> I can see, no, my family's good, but I can see my mother. What's she making a show of herself? Because she's Irish. Like, what are you doing making a show of yourself? Well, that's what I do for a living. Everything I was told by my mother not to do. She's making a show of yourself. Yes, <laughs> oh. yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but my father's like, she's got moxie. She's got that Jewish thing, like Edie Gourmet. I'm Irish <laughs> Catholic. I don't know what he's talking about, but he's on the bra. I don't know. Um, but you see, so you are quiet, you're in your head before you go on, you're on stage and you don't want to know who's out there if it's going to make you nervous. Cause then that takes you out of your, your game too. It gets you in your head. I want to know what it was like the very first night you hit that stage on Broadway as Christine. Well, I would about, have in a bucket. about 30 people from my family flew from Michigan to be there for my Broadway debut. How many? Around 30, including my my grandfather, who was in his 80s at the time. Um, so my my people were there. And- um, Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was very emotional. It was very emotional. I was m more nervous f being on stage with the rest of the cast because many of them had already been doing the show for 10 years. So- oh. Uh, you know, I just, I, I didn't want to mess it up. I didn't want to bring the room down. I wanted to to give my best to the show, to elevate it to the level that it had been playing at for 10 years. So it helped having my family there and knowing that we were going to have a, a party at Sardi's after. Sardi's was right across the street from Phantom. And so we did that. And uh, it was, you know, it's one of those pinch yourself moments that you try to really imprint in your mind. And um, 
I'll tell you another night that was spectacular. Yes. We played yes, my hometown of Detroit when I was on the national tour. The national tour played Detroit, the Masonic Temple. And there were, you know, my parents set aside. We said, we've got a big Lebanese family. We've got a lot of aunts, uncles, cousins. We're going to set aside 100 seats, 100 tickets. Well, by the time the word spread with my family, friends, and everybody I've ever met, everybody my parents had ever met, there were, I think, 412 of them. Like, a whole section. <laughs> so that night was pretty mind-blowing, too. You know, I, I look back on it, I'm just so full of gratitude that, that it happened. You know, it's wild. Cousin George was at that show, and he says it was a fun night. Oh, yay. Cousin George, also a singer and performer and uh, very, very supportive all my all my life. Well, you have a talented family, George Joseph. <laughs> and my sister, Anne, um, she says, this is wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. That's my youngest sister. Hi, Anne. Six of us. She's 15 years younger than I. Annie Banani and Matthew Polk. He has a question for you, Sandra. Do you, or of course, do you or your husband ever get the giggles when you can't stop on stage? <gasps> that has definitely happened. It's really bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it, it's that is dangerous. And I used to get it a lot with, with, <laughs> I won't say his name, but one of the gentlemen who played Raoul in the show, we had all these running jokes and during All I Ask of You, the very serious love song, you know, we would sometimes just something would strike us and we would have to fight so hard not, not to break, you know, not just to stay in it. You have to always be mindful that people paid a lot of money to be here to see this. Yeah, and yeah. we have a, you know, you take that responsibility very seriously. But especially nowadays when Ron and I, my husband and I are doing virtual concerts from our living room and our little eight month old puppy is at our feet, you know, <laughs> whining or whatever. Oh, there we are. There they are. So, right. yeah, and you know, we're doing all of our own technology and figuring it all out as we go. And uh, sometimes it's just comical and you just have to laugh. <laughs> I think to, in that setting, you can do a bit more because everybody has their expectations. But you know, I was thinking about that for you. You're on Broadway. And you're very committed to your craft. But you're a human being too. So there are days that you're not going to, no, nobody can be 1000%. You can't run a ma marathon at the same pace every single moment of every minute of every time. But I realize that people come from Singapore and South Africa and Ireland, and their dream is to be on Broadway watching you. Like, mm. Like their dream is I am watching you right now and I have saved my money and I have planned this vacation and this is everything I've always wanted. You have a huge responsibility for making people's dreams come true. I know that sounds, how do you, no, no pressure, but seriously. Uh, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And uh, one of my best friends gave me a gift during my latter years in Phantom when I was really struggling with burnout and trying to give it my best every single time. He invited me to coffee in Piermont, New York, this cute little coffee shop, and he handed me a purple box. On top of the box, he stenciled the word perspective. And inside the box, he put clippings that he'd found all over the place, all over the internet, from people all over the world talking about their dream of seeing Phantom and how it impacted them their memories, how they got engaged the night they saw Phantom, or they saw it with their mom when before their mom died. And now it's that, that whenever they hear those songs, they feel their mom's spirit with them. I mean, these incredible wow. moving stories or people, lots of young, young girls and young women who, whose dream was born if, of performing just as mine was when I saw Annie as a kid, when they were sitting there watching us, you know? And so I would keep that box in my dressing room and pull one out, pull, just read something before the show some nights to, to connect to those individuals and those families out there, you know, who it meant so much to them. It does. To yeah. come and see what we were doing. And exactly. That, and that was nothing more motivating than connecting to the meaning and purpose, the real purpose behind what you do, which is, has very little to do with you.
<laughs> I, I've just been trying to find my purpose in this downtime. So I bought a cappuccino maker and I'm learning about how to grind coffee. I'm like, I need a purpose. I said, to this, I need a purpose. Let's get me a coffee machine. So <laughs> that's what I've been thinking about. We got one this week. I'm like, okay, I got a purpose. It's fabulous. I'm going to do a commercial break and I have a couple more questions for you that are important. My guest, Sandra Joseph played Christine in the Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. The distinction of being the longest running leading lady in the longest running show on Broadway. Wow. That's a big deal. If you have comments, uh, you know, put them here. You have a question, she'll take them, but I'm going to just do a, a couple of announcements and <laughs> crack myself up. And this is the other one. Hear ye, hear ye. Um, <laughs> You guys, we played a little clip of Sandra back in the day on Oprah. The longer clip will be up on my Patreon page. That's where you can get all of these audio interviews for free on all the major podcasts, Apple, Spotify, wherever. Um, oh, okay. So my sister just made a comment. You can see all this on Patreon. I'll put the link up there. So what you'll do is get uh, the full video. And there's also backstage treats when you subscribe. Don't make me hate you. T-shirts, uh, 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 happy hour, coffee talk, whatever you want, parties, uh, different levels. But go there and then I'll give you the treat of seeing Oprah's clip uh, with Sandra on that, as well as the full interview. And again, the audio is, is free on all the major uh, podcast platforms. So there it is. And you can support the show at PayPal and Venmo if you are so inclined. But this is always here just to connect. The goal of the show, I interview cool people from academics to alcoholics. And the goal is always to be fun, have heart and be smart with what we do. And sometimes we just go, oh, fuck it. But we try it over, <laughs> overall, you know. Um, and I want you to know that you could get, oh, next week, let me let you know, Alan Zweibel will be joining me. Alan Zweibel, original Saturday Night Live writer, dear friends, best friends with Gilda Radner. He produced the documentary Love Gilda, which was out last year. If you haven't seen it, it is spectacular. He talks openly and honestly about her. I've had him as a guest on my Hangin' with Langan show on KGO in San Francisco and other places. I know him from the Friars Club. This guy, he's just so accessible. Again, another authentic, real person with such talent. And his new book is out called Laugh Lines, My Life Helping Funny People Be Funnier. Alan's Why Bell. So same bat time, same bat channel next week. Christine's book, Amasking What Matters, 10 Life Lessons from 10 Years on Broadway. So there you have it, my folks. And there we go. Look at her. Now, I know it's my commercial break. Okay. Hear ye, hear ye. Now, this is you on Broadway. Was that Ron then or not? That is Ron. That is Ron. That's Ron. Yeah, that was actually at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. when when he joined the tour. And we did that that very first photo shoot together. <laughs> so she really is a method actress. Um, <laughs> And here they are now. I mean, look at this. Yeah, you know, that was um, just in 2018 at Phantom's 30-year anniversary. Uh, what a wild ride. Oh, my goodness. I so, never dreamed I'd fall in love with my co-star in the show. <laughs> so to, we got to talk about that dirt. Come on. <laughs> it's That's so wild, isn't it? I mean. It is wild. He's pretty I, cute under that mask and makeup. <laughs> He's adorable. He has a great energy. By the way, her husband, Ron Balmer, who played the Phantom and is was in the traveling with the Book of Mormon, where I got to see him. He's a fantastic singer in uh, music that isn't from Broadway, not musical theater songs. He has um, his album. I don't even think you're allowed to call them albums, whatever. His compilation of songs that you can buy all together is uh, called Legacy. And it is authentic. And it's a guy talking about real vulnerable stuff. Man, you got to get that stuff. I'm telling you, you're going to be like, wow. Thank you, Maureen. That was really nice of you, but I mean it. Um, <laughs> Thank I, you, Maureen. That was really nice of you. But I mean, you. I meant to the audience, not too. Uh, <laughs> this is Florida George, other cousin George, no, oh. Florida George, other cousin George Pasatino. I don't know which George this is. I but. know what the, yes, there are, there are numerous George Josephs and yeah, I know you. exactly which. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Other cousin George. <laughs> Got it. Hi cousin. And I saw my aunt Kathy is on yeah. here as well. I don't know if my mom made it. I sent her the link. I don't, I don't. Oh, come on, mom. Hi family. Hi family. I love you. I love you. <laughs> so let's talk about. When did you very, when did you very first, when did you meet Ron Bomer, the Phantom of the Opera? When's the first time that you worked with each other? It was on the stage of the Kennedy Center. That was the first time. Oh. In, yeah. In 1997, I had already been doing the show for 
a couple of years at that point, but yes. we got a new Phantom. The other actor left, and this and Ron came in as a replacement, and we had some really great chemistry on stage. We did we did the Kennedy Center, and then the show moved from there to L.A. at the Pantages. And um, of all the Phantoms that I've worked with, I worked with Ron uh, maybe three, four months. I think it was four months out of my 10 some years in the show. So it was a very short amount of time ah. because at that, at that point I got moved to Broadway. So I got kind of a promotion and I left the tour and went to New York. So then we were apart and we met in 97. We married in 2002. So it was quite a, quite a long oh, stretch yeah. there of getting to know each other and friendship and eventually here we are and we moved from the east coast to the west coast now we're in san diego and yeah we've been married my gosh 18 years holy moly we are a good duo we're a good duo we have our stuff like every couple especially during covid quarantine togetherness we went from being spending long periods of time apart you know being when we're both going our own separate ways to suddenly we're home together all the time. Yeah. So it's, yeah. and we're working together, doing figuring out all this technology and doing all these new things. So, it's so how do people connect with you? Uh, it, well, it is stressful because you're creating new work in a different environment. But you're doing. A, are you still? Are you doing your? Tell us what you're doing that you and Ron are doing that people can connect with or find or hire you to do. Thanks. Yeah, we are doing. Oh, we're doing a lot of Zoom concerts for private groups. We're doing sort of an interactive, a lot of the work that we do is with financial advisors. If oh. there are financial advisors out there, we do client appreciation events where they, or for business owners, where if you want to give back to your clients, your customers, you can have a private room, a private event. And the, the, the advisors, the people we've worked with are so creative. They make up these beautiful playbill invitations. They send wine or chocolates or something. They make it black tie optional. And people come and have a private little VIP concert and conversation where we're singing some of our favorite songs from Phantom and other shows and interacting, answering questions of the audience and doing just a, a very intimate concert from our home and I have to say we really love it I was I was not sure how it was going to work at first singing to tracks you know pre-recorded tracks and I'm doing my keynote that way as well but now that Ron is here whenever I'm keynoting I I pull him into it make him sing with me at the as, usually as a surprise at the end um, so we've been having a really good time and you info at sandrajoseph.com is the email address for that and my website is sandrajoseph.com. Ron's is ronbomer.com, R-O-N-B-O-H-M-E-R. Oh, wait, did I spell it? Oh, I, I didn't spell it right. Did I, B -O, how do you spell that name? B-O-H-M-E-R. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so they could go to sandrajoseph.com, right? Or ronbomer.com to get mm -hmm. the information they want. That's easy enough. No, because we have to, we have to pivot because Ivanka Trump said you have to pivot. So I'm, I listened to what she tells me. And she said, Maureen, you have to pivot if you want to be successful. But you pivot like... I was on a, uh, a conference with Sandra and she and Ron were the surprise uh, closing act. And it really, I knew you guys were coming up the whole conference. It was like 250 people at this. So it, it was really, spect it was great. And you guys did it from your living room and it was fantastic. So if any of you big shots, <laughs> go reach out to them. And hey, I've been doing, I'll tell myself here too. I've been hosting a lot of corporate events. You see me, I do the conferences because there's the broadcasting side of me as mm -hmm. I was a journalist for so long, where you're looking at the camera, you're seeing the green room, you're seeing the the, the phones light up, you're seeing, you're talking to 8 million people and you have to know what to do when things start to tank because they want to feel that somebody's at the helm uh, yes. with confidence, you know? So I don't get freaked out if something goes awry. We're going to be okay. I got some good stories up my sleeve. I have some, you know, so we've been doing that. And also to personalizing comedy, 
not shows, but like if somebody's having a 40th, 50th, 60th birthday party, personalizing the comedy and giving them like a 10, 15 minute personalized comedy tape. So we're doing all these, we do all these things, right? That's what it's what we incredible. do. Now. It's incredible what you, what you offer, Maureen. And what I offer is incredible. <laughs> everybody who has a conference should, should hire you to they should hire us, all of us. To, to be in charge, you need somebody at the helm who has got it under control because crazy stuff happens. And you need that that confident person who can keep the ball rolling and well, keep everybody it. engaged and make them laugh. And I love the idea of personalized comedy. Maybe I'll have to talk to you about Ron's upcoming birthday. Sure, of course we would do that. Um, I know you've given me so much time, but I did have a couple more questions, if I can. What was your biggest mess up on stage on Broadway in Phantom? Oh my gosh. Uh, one time I, uh, I took a sip. There's this scene with a goblet and Christine takes this dramatic uh, drink of the wine that the phantom gives to her and I think there was some dust down in the in the cup and it got caught in my throat and I hacked for 10 minutes straight on stage when I'm supposed to be singing I was like <coughs> and then it finally cleared and I was back to like <laughs> that was embarrassing well that's rough that's rough um and how many you, you're six days a week Eight shows. How many of those shows did you do every week? I did six. I was so fortunate. To, that's how the contract started with Sarah Brightman, the original Christine. And so that's how the contract continued. So I I only had to do six. Uh, most actors have to do eight, and it's a lot. And what days would you be off? Well, they let me decide which two shows I wanted to take off. And I've never been a morning person, so I often would take the matinees off. Um, but I mixed it up. I changed it from time to time where I would just ask, want an extra evening off or whatever, just to rest my voice and, mm -hmm. and body. How hard is it to be an understudy? Um, I think being an understudy is wonderful. It's a really yeah. great opportunity. Now, you're doing the show eight times a week. When I was understudying and in the ensemble, I was eight times a week. How, how is that possible that you're, an understudy is doing it eight times a week? I'm oh, confused. because you're, you're playing in all the ensemble scenes, you have your regular role oh, and okay. that's different from a standby, which is someone who is oh, okay. just in the wings, hanging out in case something goes awry. Okay. So okay. I did, I've done both. I've been the standby and I've been the understudy where you're actually in the show in a different, in a variety of roles, but you can get thrown on at the last second. Well, you would think when you were choking, Miss Sambai would have come to your help. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it cleared pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to wrap this up with is your book, uh, Unmasking What Matters, 10 Life Lessons from 10 Years on Broadway. Here, let me put the book cover up again, you guys. It's on Amazon, and it's such a great read because you learn about her background, Chris, Sandra Joseph's background, and just there's so many good lessons in it because we're all human. And sometimes we'll see somebody end up on Broadway and think, well, what did they have that I didn't have? Well, they had talent and determination and groundedness, but they had rejection and fear and not knowing where it would all go. Unmasking what matters on Amazon. You have to get it. What I what resonated from our chat today was, you know, a girl who loved Annie didn't have these stage parents that were schlepping you 24 seven to your lessons. And, you know, my girl has to, you know, you had a half hour in a basement class with Mrs. Rice. <laughs> then you go to Michigan state and you don't even study theater. You study communications and you have a wonderful um, teacher there. And then you go to New York as a young adult after college and then immerse yourself in the classes. I take it. Yep. And so that message, to me is that because you didn't have this huge foundation of everything pushing you that way, you can still make it happen. So what do you want to talk about? Because you really address fear a lot in your book. What, what kind of message would you want to share with young girls or boys? Boys too, because we like young, young boys, not a creepy yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> and adults as well. I think it, okay. we never stop. We never stop growing. And, you know, it, it, it requires courage from us every step of the way. This this journey never, ever ends. Mm -hmm. Leaving that career, the, the whole Broadway world, and moving into 
becoming a keynote speaker and an author, I mean, I had to start from scratch again and I was scared. Daunting. It was the whole journey happened over again of walking through that vulnerability, learning how to bring my authentic self to what I was doing, finding my way of being myself out there. It's one thing to play a character in someone else's story, but when you're out there as you, it's even more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So right. I had right. to, to, to really continue doing the work and, and, and I'm a big believer in finding support, find someone who believes in you and who can help you, whether that means paying for coaching. I, I still work with coaches with uh, all 10 years that I was on Broadway. I continued taking voice lessons. I still do when I have the chance, um, acting classes to it's keeping your skills sharp but also really just finding supportive people and, and letting go of, of uh, negative voices and people who might drag you down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what, I was thinking about you leaving Phantom after 10 years and what that transition must have been like. And I saw a post from a gal I went to high school with the other day, and she was a, uh, you can't say store this, a flight attendant for 30 years. As she posted that she took a buyout during this these pandemic times and how much she's going to miss her work. And I saw so many posts that said, oh my God, enjoy your retirement. You're gonna have such a great time. And I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be hard for her for a while. This is the transition from what she's used to for so long and that emptiness and not, there's a sense I, I'm projecting onto her, but I could see in her post, it wasn't like, yay, downtime. It was more like, oh boy, okay. Now what? I could be, I, that's what I read into it. So I think people think, okay, now you get to go do this, but you carry, like you're still, I don't know, you're, the web, the, the, the tangle, you're still entangled with it. The part. You have to mourn the moving on, I think at times. I don't know if you do, but I've had to mourn when I left Bloomberg. I've had to mourn certain movements in my career. Welcoming the next, but also, oh, okay, that's over. I'm wondering what it was like for you when uh, your days at Phantom on Broadway came to an end. Yeah, I, I felt pretty lost for a while and unsure of what, I, I was just really honestly praying, like, help, <laughs> let me know what to do, where to go, how to be, what, how, how to use what I have. I was too young to retire, but I felt complete with my Broadway journey and I knew that I still had something I wanted to share, and it, but it was not yet formed. You know, mm -hmm. being in that middle place can be really scary when the new idea hasn't quite crystallized mm -hmm. yet, and mm -hmm. you're, you're sort of feel like you're floating. And I think a lot of people are going through that right now, especially, you know, Broadway performers that people in the, whose businesses are no longer what they were and we don't know when it's going to come back. Terrible. It's, it's a very, um, it's a time of feeling groundless and that's where all of the, the spiritual practices really are helpful. Mindfulness, you know, this, the simplest things of remembering to, to breathe, to pay attention to how you breathe, to come oh. back to your body, to come back to this moment. We don't have to have it all figured out. We can stay right here, right now, and be present to the beauty around us, the gift of this time. I think so much of, the, of our culture programs us to be human doings and not human beings. Yeah, and that's a good point. Very living good in the point. being space can be really uncomfortable for people, but can also be incredibly rich and vital and beautiful if we can relax into it. Um, and in the not knowing, the, the gift in not knowing is that you get to explore to figure out what is right for you. So in that kind of, oh, I don't know which way to go, you get to go different path of, oh yeah, I don't like that path. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Let me blend those two paths. You have spent more time with me today than I said we would. I just got so immersed in talking with you. You've been so generous with your time, Sandra. And I want people to get her book, get this book. You're going to love it. I'm asking what matters. Reach out to her at Sandra Joseph. Um, that's her website.com. And for keynote speaking or her, she and her husband, Ron Bomer, who was the uh, phantom, they do private uh, events, clients want to have a special surprise for their customers or, you know, whatever, just reach out. You can always inquire and see how they can make it fit for your event. 
I'm going to put you in the green room and say goodbye to you. And what I want to do, you guys, I'm so happy she joined me today. What I'd like to do is go out on a um, clip of her when she was on Oprah, because I love this clip, and let you know that next week, Alan's Wide Bell will be with me, Saturday Night Live's original comedy writer, this worked with Billy Crystal on 700 Sundays on um, Broadway, has so much, he has his new book, Laugh Lines, coming out, My Life Helping Funny People Be Funnier. And if you want to see the full Oprah clip that I have with Sandra and watch all my video podcast chats, you just go to Patreon. It's subscription-based, but it's so affordable, and you get fun treats, and life is good. Or you can do PayPal or Venmo if you're so inclined and want to keep the shows coming. Uh, let me just take a look quickly at that. Thank you, Sandra. Great show. Always a positive podcast. Charlotte, thank you to Sandra. Uh, Joy says, awesome. Oh, good. Beautiful spirit, beautiful energy uh, Sandra has. See, this is what I want, you guys. Like, I love to be a wise ass and silly, but I want you meeting authentic people on this show. I Sometimes I do get political because I can't stand what's going on, but we've been trying to take a respite from that and just connect. Let's just do some really, really good shit here and connect and be decent to each other because we really do need more of that Oprah energy in the world right now. I'm not kidding. Jen Peterman, great stuff. Damn right it is. I love my Peterman. Um, all right. So we're going to go out in this clip and you're going to tell everybody about hanging with Langan and you're going to become a member at Patreon and everything's going to work out. Don't make me hate you t-shirts also at MaureenLangan.com. So here we go. I got to get the clip. You know, and my own one man person, it's a lot on me. All right, here we go. When I was about eight or nine years old, my parents took us to see Annie on the ride home. And I started to cry, telling my parents, I know what I want to do with my life. I know what I'm supposed to do. Despite deeply knowing her dream of performing on stage, Sandra didn't know how to overcome her lack of self-confidence. I was always very shy. I wanted to sing and to act. I was very timid, and yet I wanted to do it so badly. I think for so many of us as young girls, if you have a dream, there's still that little voice inside that says, well, who do you think you are? What makes you think you're so special that you could do something that big? I had never even set foot in New York. I had never seen a show on Broadway, yet I dreamed of that. You know, I was dreaming big dreams. Whenever I needed courage that I couldn't muster on my own, I would always find my inner Oprah. Strong, confident, courageous, successful. Sandra soon found her courage. For the last 10 years, she starred as Christine in The Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. I didn't dare to dream that I would get the chance to do it on Broadway. I remember Oprah saying, God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can for yourself. God can dream a bigger dream. <laughs> I am living proof of that. Yes, you are. Bravo. So that's great. Yes, you are. Jerry Silvers, Joseph, your mother was indeed watching Sandra's. Let me pop you back in for a moment to yell out to mom. Yay. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. Thanks for tuning in. You have the most talented daughter, and she comes from very good stock, no doubt. Maureen, oh. you would love my mother, and she would love you. You guys would be fast friends. My mother's hilarious. Well, we're going to hang out, Jerry. I don't yes. know what you want to talk about. Just act like I would. I will when I see you. We're going to hang out. All right, you guys. So until we meet again, I'll see you next Tuesday with Alan's Y Bell. But follow me at Maureen Langan. Follow Sandra at sandrajoseph.com. We will see each other soon. Bye, wig. Mwah. <laughs>